Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thanks, Dimitri. So the title is Pseudorandom Walks in Directed Graphs and the RL versus L Problem. And uh, if you've seen uh, earlier versions of the paper um, posted it, we misused the word biregular. We said pseudorandom walks in biregular graphs, but it turns out biregular means something different than what we thought it did. So thanks to Dimitri for, for uh, helping me correct the title. This is joint work with Omer Reingold and Luca Trevison. So the, as uh, Dimitri said, the uh, motivation for our work is understanding the um, power that randomization help, uh, adds to computation, in particular, what kind of efficiency gains uh, it can provide. And so I'd like to start with just some sort of general musings about, um, about this uh, issue. And uh, so looking back to the, the late 70s when the power of randomization in, in computation was, was sort of first being realized. You look back and see some of the sort of classic examples of uh, problems where randomization seemed to help uh, quite a lot. Uh, one of the most well-known examples uh, was primality testing, uh, where we had randomized polynomial time prim primality tests, but for a long time had no uh, deterministic polynomial time primality tests. Another one is the so-called polynomial identity testing problem. You're given a multivariate polynomial um, in some uh, succinct form, and you want to know whether it's identically zero. Again, we had a randomized polynomial time algorithm, but no deterministic one. And then the other example, which is the focus of today's talk, was uh, uh, the problem of um, uh, connectivity in undirected graphs. Uh, I'll be more precise about this later, but uh, uh, in the late 70s, in the paper of Elinus Karp, uh, Lipton, Lovash, and Rakoff, uh, gave a randomized algorithm that used only logarithmic space for this problem, and the best known deterministic algorithms um, used uh, substantially more space or memory. So, uh, natural question, uh, which um, uh, many people have, have uh, put a lot of effort into, and one of m my main interests, is whether there are um, efficient, equally efficient deterministic algorithms for problems such as these and other places where randomization seems to help. And there's been tremendous progress on this uh, question, and especially for these uh, special cases in recent years. So, um, but more generally, these first two are special, this question for these first two are special cases of the more general question of the RP versus P question. Does randomized polynomial time uh, have the same power as deterministic polynomial time. And the final question, the one of today's focus, is a special case of the question of whether RL equals L, randomized log space versus log space. Now for these specific problems, as I said, we've had a lot of um, progress in our understanding in recent years. So most people are probably aware, uh, a few years ago, uh, primality testing was finally put in deterministic polynomial time. Um, we also have had great um, increases in our understanding of polynomial identity testing as the beautiful result of Cabanetsan and Pagliazzo actually giving a sort of a negative result of that form saying that giving a deterministic polynomial time algorithm for polynomial identity testing implies some uh, so-called circuit lower bounds which are um, considered, you know, one of the proving circuit lower bounds one of the hardest tasks in complexity theory mean so Without being able to prove circuit lower bounds, it seems hard to prove um, RP equals P. And then the starting point for our work is a beautiful, very recent result of Omer Reingold um, resolving the question of the, ran the space, deterministic space complexity of this undirected ST connectivity, showing that actually it has a deterministic log space algorithm. Okay, so in, in this work, so now that we're, for specific problems, our understanding is improving substantially, now it seems um, worthwhile to now turn our attention more strongly, not on specific problems, but on the general questions which these are special cases of. And in particular, in this work, we're going to focus on this 
RL versus L question. Okay, so first some quick uh, background to review the definitions of um, these uh, complexity classes. There actually won't be much complexity theory in the course, and we'll be done with it fairly fairly early, but um, just for terminology. So as I said, L is the class of um, problems, specifically languages, or decision problems that have uh, logarithmic space algorithms. So here, the algorithm is given an input of length n. It's given read-only access to, to this input. You know, for example, on a, like on a CD-ROM, you can think of. And then it's supposed to use only um, a logarithmic amount of workspace to solve the problem. Okay. Randomized log space is um, problems that have randomized, so log space algorithms that can toss coins, um, which make one-sided error. So on, uh, when the answer is yes, it should say so with probability at least a half. And when the answer is no, it should never say so. And NL is non-deterministic log space, um, which is a you know, like the space-bounded analog of, of NP. And from the definitions, it's fairly easy to see that um, L is contained in RL, it's contained in NL. OK, and then the kinds of, those are complexity classes. And then the computational problems that we'll be talking about are, are typically forms of ST connectivity. So this is, these are problems of the form, given a graph and two vertices in the graph, uh, S and T, is there a path from S to T in the graph? OK, and this makes sense for both directed and undirected graphs. Um, in first courses in computer science, one learns a very efficient uh, algorithm for this problem, like breadth first search or depth first search. This runs in polynomial time, in fact, linear time, but is not very space efficient. It uses linear space, because typically you need to keep track of all the vertices that you've seen. Um, if you allow non-determinism, there's a much more efficient algorithm, space efficient algorithm. Um, namely, you just guess a path of at length up to n from s, and you just as you go, just you know, start at S, guess a neighbor, non-deterministically guess a neighbor of that, and so on. And if you see T at all, you know there's a path from S to T. And if there is a path from S to T, there will be such, you, there is some sequence of non-deterministic choices that will bring you there. And this even works for the directed problem. And this um, shows that directed ST connectivity is in NL. And in fact, it's complete for, it turns out to be complete for NL. Um, but non-determinism is not a, realizable model of computation. We can't actually build non-deterministic computers. Um, so uh, something that's more reasonable is a RL algorithm, randomized log space. And here, the natural variant of this algorithm is instead of non-deterministically guessing a path, you randomly choose one. You start at S and you do a random walk. And um, the result I mentioned earlier shows that this algorithm, doing a random walk of length polynomial in N, will solve the ST connectivity problem for on undirected graphs. Because if there is a path from S to T, then with high probability, a random walk of polynomial length from S, we'll, we'll, see, event, we'll see T um, at some point. And this is because undirected graphs have polynomial uh, cover time. OK, so undirected ST connectivity was known to be in randomized log space. And then the question is whether it's in actually deterministic log space. And um, <clears throat> over the past um, 15 years or so, the progress on the question of undirected ST connectivities uh, space complexity and the general RL versus L question have um, proceeded together. So typically, um, progress on one lead has led to progress on the other and, and vice versa. So um, I won't go through all of these results, but basically the sequence of work started with um, work of Nissan in the early 90s, who gave a pseudo-random generator that fools randomized log space algorithms. I won't uh, say more about it formally, but then this was used to improve the space complexity, bound of space complexity of undirected ST connectivity. And then the ideas from that were translated back to the entire class RL to get a better bound on its space complexity. Then another improvement for undirected ST connectivity. And then Omer Rheingold uh, decided to skip a step. And instead of having progress on, on the general problem, jumped right uh, back to, uh, the, the, to the specific problem and completely resolved the question for undirected ST connectivity, putting it in log space. And so for this work, our question is to, our aim is to, given this um, exciting development, to try to return to the general RL versus L question, um, and see in particular whether Rheingold's techniques can be used to 
um, try to show RL equals L, or at least improve the best known results. So the best um, bound on the determinist relationship between randomized log space and deterministic space bounded computation is the work of Sachs and Joe, which puts uh, says that any problem that can be solved in randomized log space can be solved deterministically in space log to the three halves. Okay, so um, for people who haven't seen it, I'll just this is a quick uh, overview of, of Rheingold's algorithm. We'll say more about it formally later. Um, <clears throat> but it's a very uh, elegant algorithm. And uh, the idea is you're given this undirected graph G and, and two vertices, and you want to know whether there's a path from S to T. And the very nice idea is that, well, what, what we'll do is try and transform this graph into an expander graph while preserving sort of the connectivity of S and T. And this is done by just repeating a logarithmic number of times two operations on the graph. One is powering the graph, taking, um, say, uh, the square of the graph, so where it, paths of length two become the new edges. And this improves the expansion of the graph, but increases the degree. And then um, another graph operation uh, known as the, the zigzag product um, um, is used to reduce the degree while maintaining the expansion of the graph. And after logarithmically many applications of these operations, the graph becomes a, a constant degree expander graph. We'll define expanders more precisely later. And it turns out that in expander graphs, ST connectivity is extremely easy. You can, you can solve it by enumerating all paths of, of length O of log n, because the diameter of an expander graph is logarithmic. So if there's a path from S to T, there's a short path. Um, so what's very nice here is that even though um, so, uh, his algorithm uh, did not um, follow uh, analogous progress on RL, it is using ideas from derandomization, in particular expander graphs, which are um, widely studied in the derandomization literature. And in fact, this construction of alternating powering and taking the, this uh, zigzag product, um, this was introduced in a previous paper of, of uh, Rheingold, myself, and Avi Vigerson as a method for constructing infinite families of expander graphs. And uh, um, what Omer Weingold's uh, insight here is, uh, is that not only can these operations be used to construct expander graphs, um, but they can be used to turn any graph into an expander, um, which is, is uh, um, just a, yeah, a beautiful insight and um, gives us very elegant algorithm. And secondly, that they can be implemented in small space. But these, um, this algorithm really seems tailored, you know, even though it's using tools from derandomization, in some ways seems tailored very much to this ST connectivity, undirected ST connectivity problem. And so our question is, you know, to what extent can we relate these techniques and ideas to the general RL versus L question? Okay, and so our results are the following. So we begin by giving a new um, complete problem for randomized log space, and in particular one which brings the question of randomized log space seemingly closer to the um, types of uh, notions that Rheingold's algorithm works with. Um, secondly, um, generalizing Rheingold's algorithm, we give a log space algorithm for ST connectivity in regular directed graphs. Okay, these are graphs where all the in degrees and out degrees are equal, but they're directed graphs, whereas his algorithm was uh, working on undirected graphs. Then building on the ideas from this, we, this algorithm we actually get using the same set of ideas, not just an algorithm for solving ST connectivity in these graphs, but actually um, a pseudo-random generator for taking random walks on regular graphs. Okay, and this is, we'll, we'll see more precisely what I mean by this, but it's some way of doing um, random walks on, on regular graphs um, using fewer uh, random bits, using less randomness than doing the walk truly at random. However, this pseudo-random generator only works if the labeling, the numbering of edges in the graph um, is consistent in an appropriate sense that we'll, we'll define later. And then fourthly, we show that if our pseudo-random generator um, could be generalized, if we could remove this consistent labeling condition, then, in fact, our complete problem for RL could be solved in 
deterministic log space, and hence RL equals L. Okay, so given these results, what, what they do is they highlight the, um, the remaining obstacle to proving RL equals L as, as having to do with this labeling condition um, on, on uh, graphs. That's in some sense the, the only uh, obstacle. Okay, so I'll start, I'll try to say a little bit about each of these um, as time permits. So I'll start with this uh, new complete problem. So roughly speaking, um, the theorem is that um, a certain form of ST connectivity on directed graphs is complete for RL, specifically on graphs that are promised to have polynomial mixing time. Okay, and I will define this more precisely. Um, in a moment. So how do we measure mixing time? Well, again, informally, it's the number of steps for the random walk on the graph to converge to the stationary distribution. And formally, we measure this by uh, a directed analog of the spectral gap that was uh, introduced and studied by uh, Mihail and Phil. And the definition is as follows. So if we have a Markov chain M, you know, here we're interested in Markov chains that um, come from random walks on graphs. With a, and pi is a stationary distribution of this Markov chain. So first we can define a norm with respect to pi, which is basically the Euclidean norm normalized by the stationary probabilities. Okay, so sum of square xi squared divided by pi sub i. And here we are restricting our attention to coordinates where pi is greater than zero, where it's positive. Um, and similarly, we're only interested in vectors x that are supported on, on uh, um, whose support is contained in the support of pi. Okay? And then the quantity that we're interested in is the maximum. Um, so what we do is we look at the different distance between, so we have a probability distribution x whose support is contained in that of pi. We look at the distance between x and pi in the um, in this, uh, in this norm. And then we look at the distance after we take a random step on the Markov chain. And we look at the ratio, the maximum ratio between these. Right? And it turns out that this quantity is always at most one. And um, we let the distance, the difference from one be, we call this uh, parameter gamma. Okay, gamma of the Markov chain. Right, and really, it's gamma of the Markov chain and this particular stationary distribution. Um, because you know, there can be separate connected component, components with, with multiple stationary with different stationary distributions and so on. And this turns out precisely to be the um, up to normalization, the second eigenvalue of the transition matrix, this quantity here, in the undirected case. Okay, but, and this is an appropriate uh, directed generalization of it. Okay, and what we need to know, so if, um, if this quantity is far away from one, it means that in one step on the Markov chain, you get much closer to, to the stationary distribution. So the further, so the larger gamma is, the more rapidly the random walk on the graph converges. Okay, and so the mixing time is roughly um, log of the number of vertices divided by gamma of n to get um, close to the stationary distribution in, in whatever uh, norm you like. Okay, any questions on the missions? All right, so now formally our complete problem is the following. So you're given a directed graph G, abbreviated digraph G, and vertices S and T in the graph, and you want to um, decide um, whether your input is of one of the two forms. So the algorithm the yes instances, the ones where you should say yes, are instances where um, the uh, parameter, this gamma, this uh, directed spectral gap, is at least 1 over n, where n is the number of vertices in the graph, and also the stationary probability of s and t are at least 1 over n. Okay? So in a directed graph, the vertices can have exponentially small stationary probabilities. So this is a, you know, we only need to... So in the no instances where there's no path from S to T. So in other words, you promise that if there is a path from S to T, then in fact the, the random walk is fairly rapidly mixing, has polynomial mixing time, and both S and T have at least non-negligible stationary probability. 
Okay. All right. So first, you know, why is this in, in RL? Well, the random walk algorithm will work for will solve this problem. So if you take a random walk of from S of length roughly log n over the spectral gap, which in the case of yes instances is order n log n, then um, with high probability, well, with noticeable probability, 1 over 2n, um, this random walk will end at, at t. Because after that many steps, you'll be very close to the uniform distribution, and t has stationary probability at least 1 over n. And so repeating this roughly n times, you will see t with high probability. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's not um, important for us. We can, so it is complete even if the graph has out degree 2. Okay, but we're not imposing it that it be regular or anything. It is complete even if the graph has out degree 2, but we don't really need it for other things we're going to say. The reduction will show that out degree 2 or 3 will work. Out degree 3, let's say. No, because this spectral gap is, I mean, is measured now. This is just thinking of it, the mixing rate as a as a Markov chain. So, any other questions? Okay, so I'll go through this reduction. Um, uh, it's not a very difficult reduction. I think really mainly the main thing here is to just find the the right measures for, for, for defining the problem was, was really the main thing. Um, so we do this sort of standard thing you do when you're showing um, hardness for um, log space uh, complexity classes. So we have some language that's in randomized log space. And we're given some input x. And then we want to map it to a graph so that this uh, and, and vertices s and t. So this would be a yes instance of our complete problem if, if uh, you know, x was in the language, it'll be a no instance if x was not in the language. So what do we do? We make the configuration graph of this randomized log space algorithm. So that is, the, the vertices here correspond to the possible configurations, the contents of the work tape, roughly, of the randomized log space algorithm. And since the algorithm only uses logarithmic space, there are only polynomially many different configurations. Okay, and the vertices on the right-hand side similarly correspond to configurations. And then we put transitions between them um, based on the current coin toss of the log space algorithm. So if a coin toss of zero would take you from this configuration to this configuration, we put an edge. And similarly, you put an edge for where the coin, a coin toss of one would take you. Right? And without loss of generality, you can assume the algorithm tosses a coin on every step of the computation. Okay, and now we take this graph and we just put a copy of it next to itself many times. And how many times? We do it up to some upper bound on the running time of the algorithm. And it turns out that log space um, algorithms always run in at most polynomial number of steps. Okay, and we then set um, S to be the start configuration in the first layer and t to be the accept configuration in the last layer. Oh, so the, I guess the definition is that it halts with probability 1. And that, no, not that it halts with probability. The definition is that it, it always halts on every computation. And then since there's only polynomially many configurations, it must always halt in a polynomial number of steps. Right. Yeah, so you can take it yeah, as part of the definition. OK, so now this is fairly stand, very standard so far. So by the definition of RL, we know that if you start a random walk at s, that's a random computation of the algorithm, it, um, then if the input is, is a yes instance, then you should accept with probability at least a half. So a random walk from s will end at t with probability at least a half. And if x is not in the language, then the algorithm should accept with zero probability, which means that t will be unreachable from s. Right? And this is a sort of folklore, well-known complete problem for RL. And so our goal is to, you know, we can't talk about the mixing time of this Markov chain because here all random walks end and die off. Okay, so what do you do to 
uh, start talking. We want to talk about the long-term behavior and convergence rate of the Markov chain. So we just do the natural thing. We add a transition from every vertex in the final layer back to S. And then add self loops at each a self loop at each vertex to ensure a periodicity of the Markov chain. Okay, and then the claim is that a stationary distribution of this of this graph um, is the following: the distribution on layers, which layer you're in, is uniform. And given that you're in a particular layer, and given that you're in layer I, the distribution I want to put there is the Distribution on the algorithm's configuration at time i. Okay, so after i steps of the algorithm, what is the distribution on its configurations? Right, and the, it's easy to verify that this is stationary for this Markov chain. Okay, and now the question is the mixing time. All right, so the um, claim is the following. Suppose that I know that Sometime in the, I've walked for a while in this graph, and I know that at some time in the past, I've passed through vertex S. Okay. So if I know that I've passed through S, and I know that I'm in a particular layer, then I claim I have exactly the right distribution on that layer. And the reason is that once the, once the Markov chain leaves S, the path it follows is, is distributed exactly the way an execution, random execution of the algorithm is distributed. OK, so if I pass through S and I reach a particular layer, then I know I have the right distribution. And so then really the question is, um, how long do I need to walk to ensure that I've passed through S at least once and that I'm uniformly distributed or almost uniformly distributed on the layers? And this is, so to be almost uniformly distributed on the layers, well, your walk on the layers is just a, like a walk on the cycle with uh, self loops. And this has polynomial in the number of layers mixing time. And to ensure that I've passed through S, well, notice that you know, in every step, with probability 2 thirds, I move forward. So again, with, um, in a number of steps that's order the number of layers, with very high probability, I'll pass through S. OK, and this uh, can one way to formalize this proof is, is to, to you can turn this into a bound on the spectral gap. And the way we do it is by, by using the relationship between conductance and, and the spectral gap. But I'm sure there's other ways to, more direct ways to bound it. OK? So this is the, any questions? So that's the complete problem. Um, and now that we have this complete problem, um, natural question is, well, maybe Rheingold's algorithm directly applies to this complete problem and gives you a log space algorithm for it. So, all right, so uh, let's look at Weingold's algorithm more precisely. So we said the approach was to turn the graph into an expander. So now what do we mean by an expander? So formally, we mean a graph whose uh, spectral gap, the parameter gamma, is a constant bounded away from 0. OK, a standard definition of expanders. And right now, let's still think of the undirected case. So now his algorithm proceeds by the following observations. First, in undirected graphs, this parameter gamma, undirected ga graphs are not terrible expanders. They always have spectral gap at least 1 over polynomial. OK, and that's a well-known fact. It's basically equivalent to the fact that undirected graphs have polynomial mixing time. And then um, these operations that I mentioned, powering and the zigzag product, are analyze can be analyzed in terms of the spectral gap. Specifically, if you take the seeth power of a, of a graph, that means paths of length c become your new edges, um, then the spectral gap roughly multiplies by c, but your degree goes up um, by a power of c. And then this uh, zigzag product, um, it reduces the degree back from degree to the c back down to the degree, original degree that you had before. And it turns out that if you're doing, uh, that it, it can maintain the spectral gap up to a constant factor. And so taking this C to be a big enough constant, you um, improve the spectral gap by a constant factor, say a factor of two in each application. And so repeating this a logarithmic number of times will boost this up to a constant. Okay? And then it turns out it can be implemented in log space. And once it's a constant, then ST then the graph has 
uh, logarithmic diameter. OK, so now does this work for the complete problem? The first condition, special gap is at least 1 over polynomial. Well, this is part of the promise in the yes instances of our complete problem. So that's satisfied. Uh, the second last point here, once it's an expand, once the special gap is constant, ST conductivity is solved by enumerating all paths of logarithmic length. Well, this is not quite true in general, but it turns out to be true if S and T have at least have noticeable stationary probability. Then there's a path, and the special gap is constant, then it turns out there's a path of logarithmic length from S to T. Powering turns out to, to work. If you take the power of a graph, the stationary distribution remains the same. And, uh, and, and the parameter degree and spectral gap behave just as before. All right, so we were very excited at this point. All we need to do is check that the zigzag product works. And, and here we had to throw up our hands and we had no idea what to do. Um, so it turns out that the zigzag product and variance of it that we tried um, can completely ruin the stationary distribution of the graph. And we have no idea what, it, what exactly it does to, to the spectral gap. But even just the stationary distribution, things that uh, had very high probability can turn out to have become have exponentially small probability, and so on. And so things fall apart. And we don't know any substitute for the zigzag product. OK, so um, well, maybe not all is lost. So is there at least some class of graphs we can apply this approach to? And it turns out that. We can apply it to regular graphs, regular directed graphs. So OK, regular, as I said before, directed graph is regular. All in degrees and out degrees are all the same. So it's a deregular for some d. Um, it turns out that um, in, in regular graphs, the stationary distribution, uniform distribution is a stationary distribution. That's easy to see. And um, just like in, under, in the undirected case, the spectral gap is always at least 1 over polynomial. Now, on regular directed graphs, it turns out that the decision problem for ST connectivity is, uh, has a trivial reduction to the undirected case. Turns out if you take a regular directed graph and just undirect all edges, um, you cannot create a path from S to T if there wasn't one before. OK? So um, at first, it seems there's not much interesting in, in regular graphs. Well, this reduction does reduce the decision problem from one to the other. But the problem of finding a path from S to T, a directed path from S to T, does not seem to trivially reduce to the undirected case. In particular, if you undirect all edges and solve, find a path in, in that graph, that path may use some ed edges that are going in the wrong direction. OK, and um, the main thing we need to do to generalize uh, the algorithm for direct, regular directed graphs is the, the one thing that failed before was the zigzag product. And so this is a, the theorem which may be of independent interest. So given, um, so this is a, a graph product. So you have one graph G1 on N1 vertices and degree D1. Um, and it has some spectral gap gamma 1. And think of this as a big graph. This is the graph that we're really interested in. And uh, our goal is to reduce its degree while, while preserving expansion. So G2 is a small regular graph. Now, the number of vertices in G2 is, is forced by the definition of the zigzag product to be equal to the degree of, the, of G1. And it has some degree D2. And it has some spectral gap. And think of G2 as a, as a small constant degree expander. Okay, and we're going to use this to reduce the degree of G1. Then the zigzag product is a, is a, will also be a regular graph. Its number of vertices will go up a bit. It'll be the product of the number of vertices of the two graphs. But the important thing is that its degree will only depend on the degree of G2. OK, so if, in particular, it will be the square of the degree of G2. So um, this can be much smaller than the degree of, of, of G1, and this is why it can be used to reduce the degree. And moreover, if both graphs are good expanders, the product will be a good expander. In particular, the spectral gap is at least proportional to the product of the spectral gaps. OK, and so what I'll do now is um, describe this product uh, with pictures. Um, I won't do the proof that it, that it works, because that's, a, that's a, a separate talk. And the intuition is really, 
along the same lines as for the original zigzag product once you find the right uh, measures to analyze. All right, so we have a graph G1. This is a regular directed graph. So I'm focusing on one vertex and its neighbors. Um, so here the out degree is five, one, two, three, four, five outgoing edges and has five incoming edges. And now we're going to do its zigzag product with a graph G2 where, so the G2 is this pentagon graph here. It's a graph of in degree and out degree two. I'm making all edges go in, in both directions here. And remember, the number of vertices here is supposed to equal the degree of G1. So since G1 has in degree and out degree five, we've chosen a, a five vertex graph here. Okay, so what we do is we put a copy of this G2 um, where each vertex of G1 was. Right? And the, these vertices will be the new vertices of the, of the zigzag product. And now I need to tell you what the edges are in the, in the zigzag product. So, meaning what do we do with these edges of G1? And basically what we'll do is for each outgoing edge from this vertex, we will associate it with one of the vertices. It'll come out from one of the vertices here. So, so take that outgoing edge. Now we'll associate it, hook it up to this vertex here and then draw it into some vertex in that, in, that, uh, in that copy of G2 there, and so on. So this one will associate with that one. This edge will, outgoing edge will associate with that vertex, and so on. Okay, and this can be done in an arbitrary way, right? So the zigzag product's really not a single product. There's a the family of, depends on how you do this association, but one outgoing edge per vertex. And similarly, we do the same thing with the incoming edges. Okay, each incoming edge is mapped to one vertex here. Okay, so each vertex in here has one edge going out to some other um, cloud and one edge coming in from, every, from, from another cloud. Okay, and now um, the zigzag product, so you can actually think of the, the final graph as being the collection of light blue edges and dark blue edges. Right, that's not actually the zigzag product that um, we referred to it as the replacement product because you're replacing each vertex with a copy of G2. The actual zigzag product takes edges to be paths of length three, and that's where the name comes from. So we connect two blue vertices if you can get to, from one to the other by taking directed edges of the form, you know, dark blue, light blue, dark blue. Okay, and you can see that the degree will be only the square of the degree of this small graph here because you have D2, degree of G2 choices for where to go in your first step here, and then you have a unique out light blue edge to follow, and then degree of G2 choices there. Okay? So that's the, that's the product. Um, and uh, let's see if I want to give any intuition for why it works. You know, roughly speaking, um, what this step inside, so think of a random step on, on this zigzag product graph. Um, well, either things will become more uniform when you take this, this first step here just by the expansion of G2, if G2 is a good expander. Um, so becoming more uniform is getting closer to the stationary distribution. Or taking this step will bring you close to the uniform, I mean, or well, once you're already uniform on the cloud here, then you're following, following the light blue edge is following a random edge out of this cloud in, in the graph G1. And so the expansion of G1 kicks in. Okay, I, I don't really want to, it'll take too long to, to give a more detailed intuition for this. It's uh, sort of a separate talk. Okay, but uh, the theorem is that this, this product preserves expansion. If both are good expanders, then the new graph is a good expander. Okay, and we will apply this in the, in the algorithm. This is applied with G2 being fixed to be a constant degree expander, which means that you preserve the spectral gap. You have the spectral gap of G1 up to some constant factor. Okay, and I'll just remark that um, our proofs, when we were forced to do this more, prove it for this more general case, the, the directed case instead of just the undirected case, we actually found a simpler proof of the bound than, than the bound 
to obtain this bound in the original paper of uh, Rheingold, myself, and Vigerson, we had a much more complicated proof to get this bound of uh, pr preserving a spectral gap up to a constant factor. And now we have a much simpler, more intuitive proof of that. OK, and the consequence of this is that uh, we can solve the, the search problem, finding a path from S to T in re regular directed graphs in log space. All right, so any questions so far? Yeah, 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 that's right. And so somehow, in the earlier proof, we were using the characterization of eigenvalues as, um, you know, this uh, kind of Rayleigh quotient here, the, um, you know, mx dot x, the length, you know, looking at the, the absolute value of mx dot x divided by the norm squared of x. And this characterization only works when m is a symmetric matrix. And um, so here we had to actually go back and try to work with the original, you know, with this just the relationship between the norm of mx and the norm of x. And somehow once we were forced to do that, we were forced, I mean, that, that led us to a, a simpler proof. Any other questions? Okay, so now at least, um, you know, so given the time, I don't want to, I probably won't get through both of these, but at least I want to do this third item because this will show where this consistent labeling condition comes in. Um, and, you know, maybe I'll, I'll say a word about, you know, this, this final step, which is showing actually that um, there is a sense in which regular graphs are uh, representative of the entire class RL. Okay, so what's a, what do we mean by a pseudo-random generator? Well, so here we're interested in algorithms that produce walks on graphs, walks for graphs. So what is a walk? So you have a parameter d, which is the out degree of the graph, and you, you know this parameter. And so a walk is, of length l is just you know sequence of, of l numbers from, from 1 to d, specifying which edges to take. And now we're interested by we're interested in taking such, generating such walks um, without s knowing the graph. So, so for example, consider a truly random walk. That is, you just generate a uniformly distributed sequence here of, uh, of edge labels. Well, we know that if you take a, a random walk of um, length about log of the number of vertices divided by the spectral gap, then the end vertex of this walk will be almost uniformly distributed. Okay, and the nice thing about this is that this truly random walk can be generated without actually looking at the graph. You just, you know, choose L random numbers. Okay, so, but now the problem for us, especially since we're interested in the power of, you know, randomized algorithms versus deterministic algorithms, is that this algorithm uses a lot of random bits. For every step in the walk, you have to choose a random, so you have L steps in the walk, and each one you take log of the degree random bits to, choose, to make a step. Okay, and this can be very large. It could be polynomial in number of vertices in the graph. It's at least one over the spectral gap. Okay, and now our theorem is that we can um, generate walks with the same property that if you take them in, without seeing the graph, you generate a walk, and you take it in any deregular um, directed graph on n vertices, um, you, can end, you will end at an almost uniformly distributed vertex, and yet the number of random bits you use is much smaller than, than the truly random walk. It's only logarithmic. Okay? So specifically, the walk length is, is polynomial in the walk length for a truly random walk. It's polynomial in the spectral gap and, and logarithmic in the number of vertices. Um, and the number of random bits used is um, uh, logarithmic in the number of vertices and the degree here because I'm allowing you know, self-loop so the degree can be bigger than the number of vertices. Okay, but, and moreover the space, it's also very space efficient, only uses logarithmic space to generate the walks. Okay, however, we will only prove, we only know how to prove that it satisfies this property um, if the labeling of edges on the graph 
is uh, consistent in the sense that we'll, we'll see in a, on the next uh, slide or two. Okay, so, um, right, so the labeling of edges, notice that the behavior of the walk depends on how the edges at each vertex are numbered, right, because you're specifying, you know, what edge to take by specifying a sequence of numbers. And so this is the consistent labeling condition is some constraint on, on this numbering of edges. Okay, so what's the idea for getting our pseudorandom generator? All right, so we look back at Rheingold's algorithm. Right? Remember, it transforms any graph into an expander and then solves ST connectivity by enumerating all paths in the expander. Right? So the intuition is that instead of enumerating all paths in the expander, just take a random, a short random walk in the expander, a random walk of logarithmic length. Okay, and expanders have, have logarithmic mixing time. So this walk will end at an almost uniformly distributed vertex in the expander. Okay? And then what we need, and the very crucial additional property, is that, that this um, walks on this expander graph induce walks on the original graph. Possibly longer walks, but they, for every walk here, you can trans translate it into a walk on the original graph. Um, and now the catch is, this is true, and this was already used in, our, in, our, in the algorithm implicitly that, that finds a path from S to T, the one I described before. We, we already needed to use this, this fact. Um, but the important new constraint is that we need, we need this to happen without knowing the graph. Because remember, a pseudo-random generator needs to generate the walk without actually, by definition, without actually seeing the graph. Okay, and this is where the consistent labeling will come in. All right, so the, really the heart, the heart of it all comes in, you can even see it in one application of the zigzag. All right, so the yellow graph that we started with is the graph that we don't get to look at. That's the input graph we want to solve SD connectivity on. This blue graph is a constant degree expander that we pick and use in the construction. Okay, and now we can generate a sequence, you know, we are doing a random walk in the zigzag product of these graphs, which involves, involves flo following dark blue edges and some light blue edges. And the idea is that, well, what we need to be able to do is turn this into a walk on the original yellow graph. Right? So that means that we need to know, um, you know, when we're in here and we're about to follow a blue, light blue edge to leave to another cloud, we need to know what, what edge label that is, what number that is what number and edge that is. So the way we're going to do, I mean, to do that, the idea is we're going to try and keep track of, um, even though we don't know anything about the yellow graph, we want to keep track of which dark blue vertex we're at. So we don't know how we're hopping around on these yellow things, but we want to maintain the property that we always know which of these five vertices we're at. All right, so how do we... Let's see how we can do that. So, well, one way to do it is first to associate, to make sure that if we're at vertex one and we follow the light blue edge leaving it, it will take us to vertex one of the corresponding cloud. And if we're at vertex two, um, and we, uh, it will take us to vertex two of the corresponding cloud, and this will, you know, and this corresponds to the second edge leaving this cloud. This is also how we do the association of outgoing edges with vertices, and so on. Okay, so that's all fine. Um, now we know if we knew where we were here, we followed a light blue edge. We knew what number that was, and we knew where we ended up. So we maintain the property we want. But the problem now comes with the incoming edges. So let's see, we try and do the same thing. So, so um, let's say this is the second edge out of that cloud there. So it should come out of the second dark blue vertex and go to the second dark blue vertex here. And this is the first edge out of here, so it should come out of edge one and go to edge one. But now that one on the lower left is also the first edge out of here. So it should come out of vertex, the first dark blue vertex, and go to the first dark blue vertex. Okay, and here we have a problem because we have a collision of these two edges. 
right? And the zigzag product said we should have one incoming edge going, exactly one incoming edge going to each of these vertices, right? And already you see that what happens if, this, if, if you do this is that the um, graph no longer remains regular. And so the stationary distribution is not even uniform anymore. And you know, much less us being able to say anything about the expansion of this graph. Okay, so this is um, so this is what we mean by inconsistently labeled. We have um, from these two vertices, edge label one, both went to the same um, vertex in in G one. So yeah. Right, so the first edge out of here and the first edge out of this yellow vertex both went to the same vertex in G1, yellow vertex. And consistently labeled is a requirement that this doesn't happen, that if you look at the edges incoming to any vertex of G1 um, and look at their numbers from where they started from, the, the, so the first edge from here comes from here, goes to that vertex and, and so on, that all of these edge labels are all distinct. Okay, that is for every edge label i and every two distinct vertices, the ith neighbor of u is different from the ith neighbor of v. All right, and uh, in fact, every regular graph has a consistent labeling, but that doesn't mean that the behavior of ran pseudo random walks on on uh, inconsistently labeled graphs, you know, behaves similarly to its behavior on consistently labeled graphs. All right, so since I'm out of time. Um, all right, so so this is our so our pseudo random generator, um, and it works on consistently labeled regular graphs. It also gives universal traversal sequences for consistently labeled regular graphs. For those who know what that is, uh, which is even progress in the undirected case. Um, and then the final result um, says that if we could get rid of this consistent labeling constraint, then in fact we can solve our complete problem. Uh, in log space, and hence RL equals L. And I don't really have time to um, show this in detail, but in, in one sentence, um, we're given an arbitrary instance of our complete problem, and the idea is that we can show that there exists a regular directed graph. So this may be you know, a graph that's not regular at all. We can actually show that there exists a regular directed graph such that the correctness of the pseudo-random generators, that if the random walks behave well on this regular graph, then they also behave well on the original graph, G. Right? In some sense, this, this regular graph is, a, is, is a, some sort of blow up of the original graph. Okay, and... Uh, No. Is it definitely not we just don't know. We don't know. Um, so, so the, yeah, this is the interesting point here: is that we are not showing in this reduction that the regular case is complete. Actually, in fact, in fact, we have a log space. We put the regular case in in log space. I mean, that's what I, I showed before. So, if that if we knew how to show that, then R L equal L would equal L. Okay. So, what we're saying here is that if not only could you put the regular case in in log space, but actually do it by giving a pseudo-random generator for the regular case, including the inconsistently labeled regular case, then RL equals L. Right? And the reason is that somehow this reduction we're doing from the, from the complete problem to the regular case is not an efficient reduction. It's something that's happening only in the analysis, that we somehow reason about the performance of pseudo-random walks on the original graph by reasoning about the performance on some uh, imaginary regular graph that we don't know how to construct. Okay, and don't really have time to go into the details of this step. Um, but roughly speaking, the idea is you blow up each vertex to number of copies proportional to its stationary probability. This makes the stationary distribution uniform, um, and uh, hence that's equivalent to the graph being regular. Okay, and uh, yeah, so I won't say that in more detail, um, but the bottom line is that, um, you know, 
uh, the only, in quotes, obstacle to RL equals L is this issue of consistent labeling. Um, but I personally have not, uh, don't know, you know, whether to think this is a sort of a technical condition that needs, you know, just one more idea to overcome, or the whole heart of the problem is is relying is is lying in this consistent labeling condition. It remains to be seen. Um, that's what it seems like when you do one application of zigzag, but that's all I was illustrating is one level of recursion. Okay. So there is, um, so reality there's there's all kind of this iterate there's recursive application of powering and zigzag, and so what you get is is uh, does not I don't think have that simple a description. Is there any way to say what it is? Never mind, like why. Uh, there is one way of, of saying it. Um, all right, so I want to generate a sequence of edge labels, I1, I2, up to IL. These are all elements of D. All right, so the way in the first step, or this is not exactly, this is more, this will give you the flavor of what's, what, what the generator is doing. This is something that works, but is not what I, not exactly equivalent to what I described. Um, so I will take a, a constant degree expander on D vertices and generate um, I1 and I2 as um, uh, random neighbors, so I choose an edge in this expander at random, and I1 and I2 will come from that edge. And similarly, I3, I4, like that, and so on. OK, so I1 is at random uh, from D, and then I take a random step in a, in, the small, in, a, in a small expander to get I2. And then I start fresh. I choose I3 at random and take a random step in I4. This, this starting fresh is the thing which is not, doesn't exactly correspond to what I described. But this, this works as well. Um, and now I do a similar thing at the next level. So these come from now the set of edges. Um, that is D times the degree of the small expander. Of, uh, that's what, you know, to generate I1 and I2, it's a vertex and a random neighbor in the, in the small expander. And now I take a small an expander on this number of vertices, and I do the same thing um, recursively up, and for logarithmically many levels. All right, this does not correspond exactly to what I described here. In particular, the size in this description, the size of the small expander I'm using is changing with the level of recursion. The way I'm doing it has some way that the size remains the same, but this also works. No, no, just the bottom, just the bottom. So the root, you know, is just some random choice that induces two other things that we start at the top and generate downwards, and that gives you a sequence. This is basically the uh, the INW generator in Pagliazzo Nissan Bigderson pseudo random generator. Only later did we realize that the same techniques could be used to show that this INW generator works on consistently labeled graphs. Fresh randomness for each pair. No, no, because you're not, then we won't actually generate this level. No, so th from here to here, we're reducing the number of random bits used. So here we would have used D, um, L distinct choices. Now we're using um, uh, less, because now there's only L over two edges in the, in the expander here. And then it's L over four in that expander, and so on.